Welcome to Under the Fig Tree Podcast. In today's episode, hosts Rev. Micah Glenn and Rev. Dr. Ben Hout talk theology and life as they meditate under the fig tree. What's up, what's up, what's up? Welcome back to another episode of Under the Fig Tree Podcast. I am your host, Rev. Micah Glenn, the Director of Recruitment here at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, joined by my co-host, Mrs. <laughs> Katie Gashler, soon to be... Student Katie Gashler, Deaconess student Katie Gashler, and eventually Deaconess Katie Gashler. I haven't even made it to committee yet. Uh, I feels, might. Maybe I don't get accepted. I I feel confident. Okay. That Thank you'll you. you'll you'll be admitted, unless there's something <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, I feel like if that were the case, you wouldn't be working with us. Uh, but we're joined by a very special guest, uh, Doctor Robert Bob, probably by most people who know you, Kolb. How are you? I'm fine. I'm delighted to be back with you. Yeah, it's it's great to it's always great to have you on campus because you uh, I don't know, would you say you split your time between pretty here much here and, and Germany? Yeah, uh, where you have a, a home, I I believe. No, no, we just uh, find a place to stay. Okay, yeah, well, sure. W- one day you're still a a young man with lots <laughs> yeah. a bright horizon ahead of you. Yeah. What? Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, uh, a couple of episodes, uh, somebody guessed, we were, I, I, I asked for it, and I guessed my age. I said 42 or 43, and I'll be 40 in August. Uh, but I remember a couple years ago in class, somebody was talking about feeling old, and they said something about 40, and you said, no, 80 is the new 40, and that, that, that brightened my day. <laughs> yeah. It, it all depends on the blessings of the Lord, but uh, exactly. yeah. yeah. Well, it's always uh, great to have you around yeah. campus because you're just a... Uh, yeah, it's just a, a a beloved professor here uh, with a, a ton of wisdom, and it's it's a blessing to be able to uh, not just for me, but but um, I assume for other students to be able to stop and absorb and and sit in your classrooms and to hear uh, the things that you have to offer. I'm still there because I learn from them. Fair enough. They uh, they keep teaching me, giving me a window into into North American culture that that sometimes gets a little obscured uh, by the fact that I'm not around all that much. Lucky. <laughs> yeah. It's well, all a matter of perspective. Yeah. But, uh, uh, well, the first time I met you was at the LCMSU retreat that we had in January. Yeah. Because you guys told me to reach out to him mm-hmm. to do a session, and I'm so glad I did. I loved your session. To be honest, I don't currently remember it, but I did take a lot of notes. Well, Pastor Montz um, said he appreciated my humor. I did, too. But I didn't tell any jokes. <laughs> well, that makes sense, because I think I was the only one laughing. <laughs> but I thought it was that hilarious. Al- that always happens when I tell jokes. <laughs> it was just very, I wouldn't say dry delivery, but it was just on the same level as your uh, lecture. And I don't know, maybe it was too late for everybody else. But I thought it was so funny. <laughs> Micah knows the phenomenon. (laughs) So it happens in kind of two different ways. So I, I don't know if I necessarily, I mean, timing always, of course, but if there's a class that you're teaching and it happens to be in my area of study, of course, I'm going to sign up for it and probably would have signed up for it anyway. So if you, if you have a lot of lectures and times in your classroom, you, you know, and especially because there's you you have a particular timing when there's a joke. There's usually a pause, <laughs> yeah. uh, and then guys will that haven't had you, they'll kind of look around like I don't know <laughs> if I. And then and then you'll let them know it's a joke, and I I don't ever want to ruin that surprise for them because I'm always kind of smiling to myself around the inside because at the the bewildered faces, it's like come on guys, I don't I don't know if given history if if they'd let them stick around this long if that's actually what he believed but yeah, it's, it's always fun humor is one of the job requirements here i i, I it's <laughs> i think it's one of the greatest gifts that god has given humanity yeah imagine if life was just serious all the time yeah and uh and it really does have a a, a serious pedagogical purpose yeah uh, or, or function and uh and just People to people, uh, we got to laugh together. Exactly, it breaks down. I, <laughs> I, you know, as a young preacher, you want to be serious, 
because it's a very serious task. And when you're beginning, you're very bad at it. <laughs> and uh, it, just demeanor wise, I would in, early in my preaching days, I would I would begin with the introduction as one does or maybe not all the time. And, and people would laugh. And I. I wasn't telling a joke. <laughs> and after the, the third time, I, I just asked Dorothy and I was like, I, like I, I don't know what to do. I was like, why do people just keep laughing at these moments? And she was like, it's she's like, I know it's not a joke. And she's like, it's just the way you talk about serious, even the way you even talk about serious scenarios, because you don't, especially in the like, sometimes it has to be serious. You got to speak directly to yeah. people. But it, when you're doing a telling a story, she was like the way you pause and the way you deliver it. She was like, it is. It is comical, even if it's a serious scenario. So that I just, you just got to lean into it. Yeah. And just, but the worst part is, is when you lean into it and, and nobody laughs. <laughs> and nobody laughs. <laughs> yeah. And then you're, you're like, you, you did this great pause for effect. And you're like, all right, I'll keep going. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, I'm not any different than any of my colleagues. It takes a while to get used to the, to the way the teacher teaches and... Um, and when he's trying to bait you, and, and uh, uh, I, I purposely set people up to answer with their traditional answers that maybe aren't quite on the target for the pastoral situation we're discussing or something. Sure. And then uh, I think they remember it better when uh, they've had to be uh, gently urged to think about it from another direction. Uh, None other, nobody's greater at that in my mind than Dr. Okamoto. <laughs> yes. We'll be having a conversation yeah. and, and then he gives you the moment to reflect. And it's never, sometimes it's just no, yeah. that's wrong. Sometimes it's not quite. Yeah. But even the not quite feels like a chasm once he explains it. Yeah. Uh, and on this podcast, we were talking about maybe the Augsburg Confession. We were talking about the Articles of Faith. <laughs> And I, I said something along the lines of uh, I, I had this mindset that the, the, the confessions were the things that are either necessary or most necessary for faith and salvation. And he said no. And I was like, at first I was like, really? But then when he went on to explain what he meant in this mm. article, I was like, <clears throat> okay, I, I couldn't, I won't pretend to regurgitate in that the lesson sank in, but the lesson of don't approach it, the text that way, Yeah, approach it for what it is. Uh, yeah, it's just, especially for a young pastor, young theologian, you don't want it to be what it's not. Yeah, yeah. And, and so much depends on the whole relationship into which the conversation comes. Um, if there's a there's a kind of understanding uh, between between any of us, uh, or among any of us, as we chat with each other, it makes a whole lot of difference. So um, uh, there are ways to talk to a pastoral conference that um, you shouldn't use in the classroom, and 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 ways that I talk in the classroom that I usually wouldn't uh, try in a pastoral conference where I don't know uh, many of the people. Well, speaking of classroom, uh, we've been sending a lot of visitors to your class this semester because mm -hmm. it's at the perfect time slot, and it's you, so we know that they'll be welcomed. But it's usually <laughs> been um, one of my partners. Yeah, you guys are switch. I don't know how it works, but yeah, you'll say, oh, we're doing a plenary, and we yeah. might argue, <laughs> so it'll be exciting. You should send them. <laughs> Yeah, we uh, David Maxwell and, and Charles Arendt and I have, uh, for five or six years now, had at the very same time uh, our sections of 20, 25 students in uh, Lutheran confessions. Mm -hmm. And so we, um, we have about half the sessions with our own groups <clears throat> and about half in plenary. And, um, yeah, sometimes we say, what? to each other <laughs> sure i yeah well I, I had i didn't have dr maxwell for too many courses um when i guess even in my mdiv i i took a course you taught on from from luther to concord mm -hmm. uh but i but i had dr aaron for a few 
courses um, in particular, always in and around creation because it's something mm-hmm. that always piques my interest how we, we talk about it theologically and confessionally and, yeah. and how do we interact with it today. Uh, so I can imagine sometimes the what between the three of you. Yeah. And again, even for students, how do you, uh, how do you faithfully disagree with a colleague and brother in Christ, but, but in a way, A, that is respectful, but also in a way that doesn't, uh, break the fellowship yeah. that, that binds us together. Well, I think that's, uh, that's what we think, too, that, that having a model for constructive theological dialogue is really important mm. because it's so easy, especially why, because so many of us try to communicate impersonally on, uh, in social media and the like. Right. It's really important to see how, one, you can disagree with respect, and, and secondly, you can you can phrase your question or your um, your hesitance about what's just been said in such a way that, that the discussion goes further, that you're both then really trying to dig deeper and trying to figure out hmm. um, what the differences really are and, and how important they are. Um, so we don't, we don't plan these disagreements usually, uh, though sometimes usually. we do. Usually. Yeah. <laughs> Some, sometimes it's part of the the scenario for the whole uh, plenary session, sure. <laughs> but um, but we we are conscious of the fact that uh, we're teaching something very valuable for ministry hmm. when we when we have our little discussions. I think that's a really valuable skill to show people how to disagree mm-hmm. and remain polite to each other. Yeah. Because, like you said, in non-personal situations, like social media is the big one. You know, it's everyone does it, and they don't care how they come off. They don't care how they treat other people. But it's really, um, well, it's hard to witness. And so the opposite is really nice to see. Yeah. So that's good. Well, a friend of mine said that you should treat other people the way you'd like to be treated yourself. (laughs) So sounds like a pretty good friend. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Wise. (laughs) Uh, Dr. Kolb, uh, on, a, on a previous episode that we had you on, we, we asked you the question we asked all of our guests, what led you to uh, become a pastor and, and a teacher of the faith uh, in our well, in a couple of places in the seminary. So if you're a listener, and you're, you, you should be interested in that conversation. Uh, but we've done it in a previous episode. Dr. Kolb is a repeater guest, and so we won't ask again uh, because... Uh, there are so many other questions we could ask you and and directing new listeners back to that old episode increases our views and listens on the podcast which is something we aspire to to do so go <laughs> listen to that episode uh it's probably even possible to link it in the description of youtube uh so we'll see uh but I, and i can't but that being said i know we asked you that question uh but but we had to split our previous conversation into two episodes because Ben was here. Me and Ben had our own agendas, and your guest tends to talk a lot, which is <laughs> which is actually perfect. I you know, sometimes uh, well, you can get a guest who responds with one-liners, <laughs> and then uh, it's like oh, I had a lot of questions, but you've answered them all in fifteen minutes, <laughs> and so now the guests, or our listeners, have to listen to me ramble on about nothing for another twenty minutes, so we can get a full episode. Um, but I, I don't know that we asked you much about the, the fullness of your career. Um, and, and not because it's in, unimportant, uh, but I, I think I'm going to skip the beginning part where I, I believe you were a parish pastor. Not really. Okay. Then never mind. <laughs> then then I, I might see it's one of these things where maybe our careers are more aligned, at least at the beginning. I won't pretend like the trajectory will be the same. I don't, I don't have the aspiration to write seven books every year um, or to even contribute to 20 books every year. They all say the same thing. Fair. <laughs> uh, but, but before you got to the seminary, you were a professor at one of our Concordias, uh, at yes. Concordia St. Paul. Mm-hmm. And so how did that uh, come about, and how did that begin, and, and what was that like? 
at Concordia St. Paul. Yeah. Well, I was uh, finishing grad school. I had taken a position at the Center for Reformation Research here, uh, and that time adjoining our campus. Now it's in the library. Sure. And um, but but that was a, a position that uh, didn't pay very well. That I, I supplemented what I got at the center with teaching here and mm. and uh, also serving. I did serve in a congregation, uh, but just on weekends. Sure. And uh, so I was looking for a position. Had applied, I think, to fifty different colleges and universities, uh, inside, outside the synod, mostly outside the synod. When I think about it. Mm. Um, and uh, one day I got a call from um, General Will Hyatt, who uh, had been Army Chief of Chaplains. Uh, in, the, in the thickest days of the Vietnam War, he had stories to tell. Huh. Um, and he said, um, this is my paraphrase, you'll report for duty in September uh, for our <laughs> religion department. <laughs> I said, uh, no, no, actually I've got an interview with a uh, Virginia Tech, actually, oh. uh, in the history department. And he said, no, no, um, Steve Stolman says uh, we'd like to have you, and uh, you'll, I'll be in St. Louis next week, and we'll talk about the details of your move and whatnot. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, who, who, was I to like say, yeah, who was I to say no to a general? <laughs> and we had a very happy relationship, sure. uh, President Hyatt and I. Uh, so I was there for 16 years. Um, uh, because my doctorate's in, in secular history, although I wrote on a Reformation topic, um, I could teach in the history department as well as in the religion department. Mm. And I really enjoyed teaching Western Civ, for instance, but I also had then uh, upper-level electives, mainly in European history. Okay. Um, and uh, so those 16 years actually went by very fast. Mm. Um, but John Johnson, who was president out here at the time, wanted to form an institute for mission studies, and so he, he called me here, and it was a it was a deal I couldn't pass up. Sure. So, um, my version of the story is that they didn't want me to have too much contact with students, so they sent me overseas for half the year. <laughs> Uh, not I sort of that. like your dad. Like, yeah, yeah that's, that's what they did to I, him too. I believe it more with him than with <laughs> you, but yeah. yeah, I know him better. So yeah. <laughs> um, we we actually got a very significant grant mm. if we would help post-Soviet churches, and so um, my wife and I spent three months of the year teaching in Russia, Estonia, Latvia, uh, not in Lithuania, mm. but um, I think your dad's been more in Lithuania. Um, Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia was one of our favorites, um, Hungary, and then the post-Soviet churches got to the point where it was nice to have an American stop by, but you didn't have to lecture all day. You weren't the only act uh, in town. Sure. And so uh, our, our colleague Victor Raj got me to India four times. Mm -hmm. That was great. My doctoral student Makito Masaki was president of Kobe Lutheran Seminary, and he um, he got, got us there for a couple months, hmm. and so uh, it was just a great blessing. And once I retired, still done some teaching in uh, Sweden, not not for several years, but in Slovakia and the like. Uh, but I spend most of the of the six months over there in uh, research and writing. Well, when I was in Westfield House and. Because, uh, well, Dorothy had gone, and I I mean, it's one of those things where people ask, like, did I travel when I was a kid because my dad was a Marine? And I'm like, oh, well, just to Hawaii. And I imagine for some people it's like, well, just yeah. Hawaii, but just to Hawaii. It's not – you don't need a passport to go there. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so Dorothy and I met, found out she was British. She went to study in Westfield House. And, uh, I mean, my whole plan was really to go to Propose. Like, seeing England was by far secondary. <laughs> Uh, but then I got to England. Uh, we went to, well, just because we're trying to take advantage of a, a week of spring break, we went, we went to Calais, which is, I'm sure the people of Calais are very proud of their town, but if you're sightseeing, there are other places in France, I'm sure a little more worthwhile than Calais. Yeah. Uh, but we took a ferry from Dover, which is, I, I proposed on the ferry with the white cliffs of Dover behind oh, our backs. 
Uh, but then we went around London, which was incredible. And then we got to Cambridge, which just walking from the train station to Westfield House, uh, you pass the Round Church, which is a Norman yeah. church from the 12th century. Uh, and something magical happens and you're captivated yeah. by history that you don't know yet, but but somehow you, you know it. Uh, and then I sat in on some courses at, at Westfield House and I just told myself if I'm ever a student, I'm going to do this. Uh, and studying at Westfield House was, was transformational for me just because uh, you have lectures at Westfield House that are really structured for se- to mimic seminary. Well, not to mimic. It is their seminary, yeah. but to be uh, complimentary. But you, you go and you listen to lectures from Cambridge scholars uh-huh. that I don't want to say don't necessarily care about Lutheran doctrine, but none of them were Lutheran. Yeah. Um, and so it stretches you. It challenges you. Uh, and it makes you really in the context of firm what you've been taught yeah. and what you believe in the best way possible. The whole point of telling this story was that um, it, it, Dorothy traveled around during breaks because their breaks are different. You get months at a time. And once you're in Europe, travel is. You, you think about going to Europe from America, you're looking at plane tickets and things like that, and everything looks like it'll cost thousands of dollars. But once you're there, you, you can fly from England to Germany for 30 bucks yeah. round trip. Um, and so we had plans to travel around different places in Europe. And then, uh, well, then Dorothy got pregnant. And, and so our oldest son was born and we even for a brief moment thought we were the type of people that could still backpack around Europe with a a newborn (laughs) strapped to our chest, but we were not built for that. We, we went to, to Inverness to see Loch Ness when Johnny was a couple months. And that was the thing where we were like, okay. This was it's a fun trip. It's going to happen. <laughs> and when Dorothy offered, uh, she said that I could go with classmates and travel, but I I considered it. I was like, it would be fun, but I was like, I really imagine doing this with you. Uh, Europe's not going anywhere anytime yeah. soon, I don't think. I was like, well, we'll get back. But it's one of those things, and, and my whole point of bringing up this conversation of shared experience of traveling abroad, because you have experience of traveling abroad, and it's something I, I especially tell our young American students. Uh, if your college has an abroad opportunity, yeah. you like I don't want to say you have to do it, but don't think twice because there are always agreements that the money that you're going to spend here for education is almost always the same that you'll spend in the abroad experience whether it's yeah. going from different places or going to a single place it, it'll 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 reshape your worldview and it'll change what you what you had assumed previously about yeah. a particular place mm-hmm. let alone the world uh, and it's just one of those things where um, especially for for young people uh, I feel like it's so critical for a lot of the reasons you were talking about in the age that they're growing up with social media where interaction between next door neighbors is impersonal let yeah. alone people on the other side of the world uh and it especially for the church it's just just one of these things where you, it's it feels critical yeah because i can only imagine uh what teaching in post-soviet yeah europe was like uh, it was learn learn thousand things a day uh in dialogue with <laughs> with those people but yeah I, you know we we've got a number of opportunities here with Westfield House over Ursula in Germany. Yep. I usually uh, check in on whoever's there from, from our campus for the year because I spend some of my time in, in not too far from Frankfurt and sure. over Ursula. Um, but we've got other possibilities. Uh, Korea is probably a little harder language wise. Maybe. Uh, I imagine. <laughs> yeah. But uh, uh, Brazil or, or uh, I think maybe now we've got. A, possible exchange with Argentina it could be I'm, I'm not sure I know Brazil is a, a yeah. possibility yep. yeah and uh, so there the, there are those possibilities and we, we've also just uh, begun to talk again um, about the synod's possession of the old Latin school um, just 40 meters 30 meters from uh, the town church in Wittenberg look at that um, we have 23, I think, beds there, so um, we could we could do some seminars and whatnot uh, in Wittenberg, and and probably then do some travel. I I had plans for a continuing education program. 
Oh, yeah. But maybe next summer we'll we'll get uh, on its feet. Uh, but spending five days just walking around Wittenberg in the mornings and in the afternoons doing a seminar on a couple of, of Luther's most important works. Uh, so that's really some exciting possibilities for for people who don't get to travel sooner to do it here. Yeah. Yeah. I, I took uh, when when we were in in Russia twenty years ago now. Oh, I still uh, remember the day that um, I won't say his last name, but John got caught in an elevator in a um, <laughs> in a sixteen or eighteen uh, floor uh, Russian apartment building. <laughs> trying, I just landed, was totally exhausted, and he and four or five friends uh, were going up to to the apartments where they were going to stay, and they were caught in a in an elevator. I don't know if he's gone back to Russia since then. <laughs> Yeah. Was my dad stuck in the elevator too? Was he? Was he? No, he wasn't oh. along on that trip. So okay. uh, yeah, <laughs> but I'm sure he's got experiences to tell. Yeah, he does. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to have him on. I did say sure. that yeah. to yeah, you, of but yeah, we'll have to have him on. Yeah, yeah. We were uh, we were together in Wittenberg last summer and had uh -huh. a delightful day or two together. So. Yeah, now Germany is definitely high up on the list of places I want to go. Well, because even just you're talking about continuing ed, we have an opportunity every January, it feels like. Uh, President Egger's wife, Tori, takes a, a group of students to the Dominican Republic mm -hmm. uh, to see their seminary and the ministry they have going on there, which, of course, doesn't necessarily have 500 years of Lutheran history, but um, well, my in-laws are, are missionaries there, and we went to the well we didn't go to, we didn't go to their home we went to a nice resort in the Dominican Republic <laughs> a couple of years ago uh, but in conversation uh, you know they've been there since 2016 and uh, when we went just a couple of years ago they had just gotten electricity in their neighborhood uh -huh. and <laughs> we, we we did take a, a trip across the the country to for a day trip in I, my my children were young, but still, we're in a van and they're looking at kids their age sitting next to you know aluminum shacks and baskets of um, you know produce, asking, well, why aren't they in school? Uh -huh. And giving them an opportunity to learn as well. But we do Israel trips, and uh, it, it's just one of like I I like the idea of the Israel trip again. One point I'll go because then you get to go and walk and see the places where. Jesus's ministry took place, and yeah. I imagine for Wittenberg, it's it's kind of the same. Yeah, and it it just your imagination because we've grown up hearing these stories and and learning the history. It just puts a different when you when you see the space when you have it in your mind of you know walking from Capernaum, uh, Capernaum to Jerusalem. You're like, how could they? But then you realize, oh, it's this is this is all actually happening in a relatively for us in America, yeah. small space. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can get from from where Luther lived as a as a friend uh, as an Augustinian brother to uh, the the door of the castle church where he may or may not have nailed the theses. <laughs> um, you can do that in an easy ten minutes. Yeah. Uh, I've walked it many many times. So. One thing I like about traveling overseas and I, I haven't gotten to done to do it much as an adult it was mostly as a kid mm -hmm. um so I didn't have that appreciation as a kid but leaving the states and going to something that is just far older than anything here that's kind of mind-blowing mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah um yeah you brought you kind of brushed over it a little bit but um yeah, we have such a young history here compared to the rest of the world, and you yeah. get into these buildings that were built in the Middle Ages, and how can you even comprehend that they were able to build this yeah. or do that way back then? So Yeah. Well, we also have a habit of tearing our history down in the States. Mm -hmm. um, not completely, of course, but we do have a habit of doing that and, and putting something new in its place to where that's it's unthinkable in certain places in the mm -hmm. world. Uh, I mean, even, again, I was talking about the Norman church. Mm -hmm. 
in in Cambridge, I, I mean, there are, are Roman ruins in England. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hadrian's Wall and Bath and even uh, York, there are Roman bathhouses. And then there's a, a Roman bath and then there's Viking relics and just all these different things. It's just uh, such a remarkable thing to go and see and experience uh, firsthand. Well, when you, when you come to Mainz, if I'm there, uh, I'll give you the tour. Uh, it begins with a Roman theater, Look at that. goes to um, the basement of a shopping center, which was delayed for, I don't know, months and months, mm-hmm. the construction, um, right on the edge of, of the old town, uh, because as they were digging for the foundations, they found a temple uh, to Isis and a temple to um, Mater Ma- uh, Magna from the time of Ves- Vespasian, around, around 70 AD. Hmm. Um, when, when Jesus was living in Palestine, um, there were uh, about 25,000 Roman legionnaires and their families and their suppliers in Mainz huh. on, on the Rhine. So that, that, that's a very interesting museum. And then you can go to the cathedral that was built in 1016, no, 1006, I think. Okay. And, um, uh, and then end up with uh, the Church of St. Stephen, which was also built in the 11th century, um, but was bombed on the 27th of February, 1945. Mm-hmm. and um, uh, was restored then, but without stained glass windows until the 1980s when a Roman Catholic priest who was half Jewish um, and who lost his father to the Nazis said, we gotta get, we got to get stained glass here. Let's have Mark Chagall, uh, a Russian-born Jewish artist uh, who lives in France, to do the windows. And so Chagall designed, um, not all of them, but the, the, the sort of the, the whole biblical history that's in the, uh, in the altar uh, area. Hmm. So um, there's, there's sort of 2,000 years of, of religious history, not just Christian history, right. within a couple square miles. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and again, if, if you're listening and you're, you're thinking about becoming a student, uh, this would all be, it's, none of it's guaranteed. Some of the abroad positions are competitive, but you come and yeah. you, if you want to take it seriously. It's, it's def- the opportunity is there. And so, uh, yeah, come and, come and while you're learning how to become a pastor or a deaconess, travel the world. Yeah, and I, I hope that Wittenberg really turns out to be a place where we can have students uh, not for a whole semester, although that would be great too. Sure. Uh, and we we will have the space. There are Ukrainian refugees right now in mm-hmm. the in the old Latin school, but um, we hope that era will end um, before yeah. too long. But um, but we'll have short term as well as longer term uh, possibilities. So yeah. Um, kind of taking a step away from just the a broad student experience uh, it's something that you mentioned in class and something you've mentioned already this aspect of uh, ongoing learning that you receive from students in the classroom if you could think of some of the greatest joys uh, that you've had in your career of uh, teaching uh, and again, um, I don't know if we mentioned this last time, but the the DCEO the DCO pro, DCEO the DCO program from Concordia St. Paul you were part of uh, starting, um, and so you have a, a history of teaching church workers for 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 quite some time. What if, what have some of those again joyous occasions look like and and been like? I I think. One sort of generic description would be um, those aha experiences when when students give you an idea you'd never had before, mm. or direct you to something in a say a Luther text or a confessional text um, 
that I'd stumbled over and and not really gone into depth on. Um, one of my uh, teaching devices is to say that the answer to all religious questions um, is why do you want to know? Hmm. Because I think we have to get to the agenda of either law or gospel uh, and what kind of law, what kind of gospel um, is the person really seeking? Um, I, it just came out of, I can still remember sitting at the, at the dining room table uh, my first year of teaching at Concordia St. Paul and, and I was trying to figure out how to teach the doctrine of election. And I thought, what would I say if somebody asked me, uh, Pastor, am I elect? Uh, would I say, yes, of course, and they might say, oh, good, then I can sin the more that grace may <laughs> abound. Or uh, if I'd say, well, how would we know that? They, would, they might say, I'm so bad that I know I can't be elect. Mm. And so I need to know why they want to know why they're asking the question. My, my colleague, Jack Preuss, um, before he went to Concordia Irvine as president, um, said, uh, the question behind the question is the one you have to answer. Mm. Um, and so w one of the, the sort of silly but neat things that I still experience is students uh, coming up to me and saying, hello, Professor Kolb, why do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, something stuck. Maybe not much, but at least that much. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that was that was one of the most satisfying things in in uh, Russia and Estonia and Slovakia, the places where we went uh, uh, practically every year for twelve years or fifteen now thirteen fifteen years. Um, I got to see kids, I'll call them, really young young men, and and some deaconess types too, uh, women as well, who uh, the first year I was in Russia, for instance, in 1994 and 1995, were in one of my seminars. And then toward the end of my time there, 2005, 2006, they were teaching. Uh, sometimes using some of the stuff I had given them, actually. Sure. But uh, there was a new generation of students. But it was, it was very satisfying to see that seeds you plant actually can start to blossom in a, in a relatively short time. And... Uh, but I, it's just the adventure of, of, I teach Lutheran confessions every year and find new stuff in, in their texts uh, every time I prepare, um, in part because I'm looking at the texts with a different set of experiences from the last year, but also in part because they're coming out of, out of their various worlds with questions or observations or, and see things in the text that I hadn't. And so uh, that process of never-ending learning is really fun. Uh, I always say nobody brings uh, professors a ham at Christmas. Um, I don't, the I don't, seminary does. Like yeah, the, I was going to say, we the, got one. Um, the, I, don't, and I don't know if that happens in the parish anymore or not, sure. but in, in the days of my youth. But, um, but we get satisfaction out of seeing you a couple, three times uh, in the course of, of uh, your three years with us on campus. Um, parish pastors get to see, sometimes if they stay longer, kids they baptize, confirmed, mm. married, um, and so forth. And so uh, you get, you're living with people on a daily basis. And, and that, that's the most satisfying thing in the world, I think. Um, all the way from the rejoicing over a newly born and baptized baby uh, to uh, accompanying grieving people to the graves of their loved ones or uh, accompanying the loved ones into death. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so the satisfaction of being a parish pastor, being a deaconess, uh, being a parish school teacher, uh, a DCO, DCE, uh, those are satisfactions that are are different, and and in some ways I think uh, I always say I'd have rather been a parish pastor. No, 
If I had wanted to work for a living, I would have been a parish pastor. <laughs> but I, 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 ch I chose Easy Street. Sure. But, um, but there, there's a kind of satisfaction you have as, as someone's pastor or deaconess um, that we don't, we don't get. And that's, you know, that's just the calling the Lord gives you. Yep. No, if people ask all the time, uh, especially recently, because I, I had been serving a vacancy, um, and they ask, did I enjoy it? And, it, you know, it's, it's a mixed answer. It's like, well, the work of it, of, uh, of, of teaching, because uh, a lot of new Christians in the mm -hmm. parish I was in, teaching them stories of scripture that they hadn't read before or weren't knowledgeable about before, introducing them quite often to uh, Lutheran doctrine uh, for the ones who had grown up in other Christian traditions, especially Roman Catholicism, asking, well, the Roman Catholic Church taught this. This sounds familiar, but it sounds also radically different. Uh, can you help build the bridge? And you're right when... I always try to I try to start simple and if more and let more questions come from that. I, I fail at it every once in a while just because we're just nerds and we read these books and yeah. sometimes people ask questions and, and just the language of the text you were just reading just comes out and they're like, Well yeah. what does this mean? I'm like, Don't feel bad. Yeah. Nobody other than theologians <laughs> use that word. Uh especially in this context. But it, it is one of those things where because I was called here, because I have a family and trying to do a, a bunch of things, there were moments that were significantly profound that mm -hmm. that did bring about satisfaction, but I didn't have a lot of time to to stay in the joy because it was go yeah. back and, and speak with a new recruit. But e even in, in recruiting, um, yeah, there, there are times where somebody's calling and they're, they're going through a discernment process and... Mm -hmm on either end where, where somebody says, well, I feel called, so I need to do this. And it's like, well, that feeling is great, uh, but it doesn't mean that <laughs> you are in fact called. Yeah. Uh, you won't know that in fact, until you receive a call. Yeah. That's the only thing uh, in our theology that affirms your call is the actual call. Yeah. Uh, but if you feel called, that's that's a good thing. Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, come pursue it. and and find out yeah um but but even in that where why do you ask and, and so where well what is the phrase gonna be like where some because somebody could be like well i don't know if i'm called mm -hmm. but people keep telling me i should be a pastor a teacher a deacon and I'm like well that's good yeah because right now you're not called <laughs> but uh come find out if you are called into this and so it it it's just kind of that kind of law gospel aspect of, of the work yeah. uh, where, again, keeping these things bef before us, because, again, it is, it's a very serious business. Yeah. Um, and we want our students to approach their education that way. And, I, you know, challenging, don't want to scare anybody off, per se, but it, it, yeah, it's serious business. We're, we're playing with people's salvation after mm -hmm. all <laughs> yeah and so uh yeah we want to make sure that we're taking it seriously in our work so there is some some people ask about it. there's there's some pastoral aspects even as a professor here where students are going through things we all do yeah it's, it's a challenging context and life doesn't stop here that's uh, while you're in the formation process yeah. tragedy strikes and all these types of things uh and there there had been times, especially when I went back in the vacancy, where I was like, man, I've been in the institution for so long. Not that I had forgotten how to preach and things like that, or that I had forgotten how to care for people, but... Doing it. The, the, the muscles weren't stretched. Yeah, and then, yeah. And then something happens, and then the things that you practiced and that you were taught over the course of four or five years kick in. Yeah. And uh, you, you just do it. Yeah. Uh, often for me to your own surprise yeah. uh and then you're grateful for and then when people ask about the formation process that we use like there's 
there's a there's a real reason behind it. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. and when people ask, four years is a long time. I'm like, you know, before you start, it feels that way. But when you receive your first call, it's not long enough. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All of a sudden, uh, find comfort in knowing that you won't know what you're doing exactly, when you graduate. Yes. Exactly. People no one start does. calling you pastor <laughs> and they're asking you questions <laughs> and expecting a real answer, and you can't use the old line. Well, I'm just a vicar. Yeah. Let me ask it. <laughs> really sets in and uh, Pro professor thompson uh, and i got acquainted 35 years ago maybe already he's so young uh, <laughs> but um he was vicaring in minnesota All right. and uh, had me uh, to his vicarage congregation to do a, a workshop with uh, college students actually so we've known each other for a long time uh, and then when he was in southwestern Missouri, he had me down and I did a witness workshop and preached in his congregation. And then he had me uh, preach his installation service at Zion in Peavley, just south of St. Louis, mm -hmm. before he came, to, uh, came here. And I said, well, in my sermon, I said, well, you probably thought that we trained him to be a pastor in, um, at the seminary. We trained him to be prepared for training as a pastor in his first congregation. And they did, did a pretty good job, but uh, his second congregation had to, you know, do a little more polishing. And now that I think about it, you're called to make even a better pastor out of Matt, mm. Mark Thompson. So, and they, they actually did, did a good job too. So uh, <laughs> I'm, we're glad we have him here now. But uh, um, yeah, I think that's one of the joys of ministry, that you're always learning, you're always growing, you're always, um, even in the, in the uh, hard days when people are dying that you didn't want to die and so forth, um, the Holy Spirit just is there to, to say, look at, look at the wonders of the way I run the church. You may think it looks sloppy, but it's, it's got a plan. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, even when we we fell, there was a moment in, in the vacancy where, well, I was busy, and uh, I had missed a significant thing uh, for a member, and uh, one of the new elders, first-time elders of the congregation, texted me, hey, this is important, can I call you? And I'm getting ready to jump on an airplane, I'm like, if it can be quick. And then just in the phone call where he's like, hey, this happened, they were upset, uh, you should probably call them. And then, uh, okay, we get off the phone, and there's that moment where it's like, well, they understand I'm busy and I'm part-time and all these other things, but then the moment hits where it's like, no, uh, whether you're a vacancy or part-time, you said that you would do this work, and you you failed in this moment. Uh, but then when you call the person and they let you know their grief of uh, not a broken relationship, but where, you know, again, where you failed in the relationship, yeah. at least in the aspect of it, right? But then uh, the generosity of parishioners, of uh, brothers and sisters in Christ to recognize that, uh, yeah, you're hopefully trying your best. Uh, but but even just the admission from you to say, I'm sorry, yeah. as a pastor to a parishioner, that uh, I should have been more, uh, I, I should have been a better pastor for you here. Mm -hmm. uh, it talking about I don't know if parishioners are necessarily students, but they are the people you're called to serve, and yeah. I'm sure that that relationship is has some similarities to it, to where your parishioners are going to teach you how to be yeah. a a pastor. Yeah, uh, it's such an incredible thing, and it, it's just the way that Jesus designed and set up the church. Yeah, is a uh, I don't want to say we don't we don't think about it enough. But we probably don't. <laughs> That's probably true. <laughs> yeah. um, oh, I was going to say, well, my thought isn't formed yet, so I'll just start talking and see what happens. Yeah, there we go. I do <laughs> yeah. that all yeah, the time. Yeah, yeah it'll yeah. go somewhere. Yeah. Um, as a pastor's wife, seeing my husband Paul in his first congregation and how much he learned from them and how... He just got so much from them. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know if they realize how much they, he, that they gave him. Yeah. And um, because when we announced that we were leaving and we had our last Sunday, you know, they were 
thanking him for all these things, and which was very great, and I'm very glad they did it. But um, they just poured so much into him and to us too. So that forgiveness and patience goes both ways. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Well, to shift gears a little bit, uh, and, and may, not for a long time, I said <laughs> we weren't going to get into a, another three-hour episode. Um, <laughs> the day is young. But 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 my wife and I uh, and our three children, we became members of Timothy Lutheran. Uh, well, <laughs> we became members at the end of last summer or in the middle of summer somewhere, uh, and I've I've just now uh become a a regular member of Timothy, although Dorothy and the three children have been. Um but I, I just I guess I wasn't quite aware of it because something happens in and around the seminary because you have a lot of field workers in different places, but when you have uh faculty members and a lot of institutions where pastors work, you sometimes end up in congregations where there are a lot of pastors along with the pastor. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so it, uh, just off of well, what I could tell is there's there's you, there's me, there's Dr. Seleska, uh, Dr. Herman uh, is a member, Dr. Nielsen, exactly. Yeah. Dost is a member, but he doesn't come either. I, he's, <laughs> got a, he's got a vacancy uh, that probably is a, you know, a long-term vacancy. Sure. So, so we, see, we see Nanette, but we don't see Tim Dost. So. Right. But, and Dr. Maxwell, I believe, yes, is a member. Yes, Maxwell. And then there's some retired pastors del yes. crockett who yeah. i got close with because his congregation uh used the space of all nations yeah uh and then another i uh, another pastor that I, I i don't know but is it pastor winner is that yeah. his name? who was uh, in the philippines and then was head of lutheran hour ministries uh, overseas oh, operation right i thought holy cross had a lot right uh, but that was a list that was like four times as long as the one in Holy Cross because we have quite a few seminary professors that's what too. I, yeah. See, yeah. Well, it, it, we well we have to go to church <laughs> somewhere, <laughs> yeah. and it's 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 tough, I think, to be a pastor at one of these congregations. Um, I try to make it very easy because uh, I when I go to Bible study, especially if if it were Pastor Dinger, our our pastor, I would just listen and learn because that's. Right. Yeah. And I, I would, I've done that all the time. And if anybody, every once in a while, a field worker will be teaching a Bible study and then I'll be like, well, Pastor Glenn, what do you think? I'm like, oh, you're doing fine. Just keep <laughs> yeah. going. Don't ask me. I'm just, I'm here to learn. <laughs> they don't want to listen to me lecture. That's why I'm sitting back here. Um, but, but as a, a institutional pastor, uh, what is that? How have you experienced that relationship between uh, you and your pastor or, or pastors and other pastors? Because I think that's something that, again, doesn't get thought about, a pastor shepherding other pastors in his congregation. Well, and that, that's what I really like about Pastor Dinger. Um, but his predecessors, uh, Ron Rawl and, and Bill Wilson, uh, were also just like that. They weren't intimidated at all. Mm -hmm. And they just preached to the whole congregation uh, they didn't try to. They didn't try to tell us, "Look what I still remember from your class," or something like that. Right. They just, they just went on pastoring, and um, and all three of them have been very good pastors for me. Um, uh, the thing about having pastors in your congregation is that uh, that you do get relief some Sunday mornings because. Uh, the pastors like to preach too, and uh, uh, and you can use them for Bible classes. And uh, how many Bible classes do we have at Timothy? Four or five, six. Thank you. Yeah. 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 And uh, uh, some are even teaching Sunday school kids. Yep. So uh, so what? But what I like about my pastors, and this intimidated Ron Rawl at first when he, when um, I, he first noticed. 30 years ago, I was taking notes. And he thought, why is he taking notes? Well, because I want to plagiarize you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I need all the good ideas I can get. And I get them often from my pastors. So sure. I'm, I'm trying to 
starting to think about an article that I someday may write about the concept of merit. Oh. Because it's an important rejection of the merit in the whole medieval system of salvation, how you, you need to get some merit to show that you've got God's grace and the like. And um, there were a couple things that Andrew said in his, his sermon uh, that sparked me about four weeks ago, and this last Sunday too, then I just supplemented those notes on merit to, with more good ideas. Sure. And so, uh, yeah, I, uh, I find, uh, well, y you, just, you just see the world from a different perspective. Uh, during the COVID time, I went on with my life pretty much as, as usual. I taught in India actually during the COVID time because, uh, because I could get beamed in, didn't have to get on a plane. Right. And, uh, uh, but in that time, Pastor Dinger's talking to the crises in people's lives who are lonely, hmm. who, who felt alienated through um, various things gave me a window to the world that I didn't, wouldn't have had otherwise. So I, um, I exploit my pastors for all their worth. <laughs> I, I, again, <laughs> right now, uh, we'll see in the future. I, it's one of those things where, like, uh, right now I'm, I'm just focused on a particular thing because I have to be. Yeah. And I, I see it in everywhere. And then, and then you write it down because – Sometimes the thought is valid, and sometimes it's like it. Yeah, you, you wanted another argument. It's just <laughs> completely not there, and you're fabricating it. Yes. So let it go, erase this <clears throat> part, or at least scratch it out to let you know that it, that's not a good direction. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's one of those things. That, yeah, I people ask, and uh, even now there was a, there's a, a a guy, a man in the congregation that was who's now in our S and P program, and I was. Once I announced that there was an, a definite end to my vacancy, we began to work. I was like, so in the process, I was like, we could just wait until you got in the S&P program and it could slap you in the face um, a little bit. Or while I'm here, uh, you could begin to do more yeah. and to explore more. Um, and it would always be the scenario where he would he would send me kind of his, his thoughts for a discussion and Bible study where he, 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 want, like he, he, he could be a linguist, um, but he's, he's not yet. <laughs> uh, John, I love you. But he, he relies way too much on, when, when it comes to like biblical interpretation, he, he relies way too much on etymology. I'm oh, like, yeah. I'm yeah. like John. <clears throat> <clears throat> One word that meant something different a thousand years ago, it doesn't mean that there's any relationship between those two things anymore. Yeah. Uh, it, it, even in biblical times. And you have to be very careful of the genre because they could be using the word similar and there could be some etymological sim similarities, but, but that's not what he means. Yeah, yeah. You got to let that go. And he, he would always do it. And I'm like, I, I don't know how many ways I can tell you that this is not good <laughs> theology, John. But, but, but it was also good where he was like, well, what should I change it to? I'm like, well, I've given you my thoughts on what you said you were going to teach. Uh, but the thing is, is when you're the pastor, you can ask other pastors what they think. Yeah. Uh, but you're the one that has to teach it. Yeah. And so when they ask questions, yep. you better have answers, yes. <laughs> especially if you've, if you've taught something a particular way. But uh, we'll talk about, yeah, my kids right now are in fourth and third grade and and, and Dr. Herman is teaching there, oh, yeah. of course. Yeah. And so our daughter, Talitha, I want to have her on the podcast someday. It'll be the cutest episode yes. of Under the Fig Tree <laughs> ever, but she just does remarkable things. I always want to take credit for it just because she's my daughter. But she was just not that long ago, I was out and Dorothy recorded a, a video of her. She she does evening prayer and sings a hymn before bed. She would go to tuck in for prayers and she just gets it out and doesn't yeah. ask questions, and she's just, away we go. Oh, that's neat. Uh, and she was singing The Lamb, and then after singing The Lamb, uh, she had this little theological exposition that was on her heart, and she was talking about how the text of the hymn was similar to Abraham and Isaac. 
Ah. Uh, and she just went on and she was like, and these this this verse connects to this verse in this way, and and Abraham was gonna sacrifice Isaac, but then God provided a lamb, which represents the sin that took away the sin from Isaac and Abraham, and, and that's what Jesus is for us. It's yeah. like, who, who taught you this? Yeah. <laughs> and, and it happens all the time. And she's been doing it for years. Even we were doing uh, the story of the people in the wilderness where God provided man and quail, and she had this little exposition of how it's like the Lord's Supper. <laughs> and, I, and she's she'll, she'll, she'll be nine in July. <laughs> and... Uh, Again, you have uh, two parents who are church workers, who are academic theologians. Yeah. And of course, we talk about our faith, but we don't do it that way. But yeah. she, she Future just reads. head of the deaconess program yeah. Yeah. someday. <laughs> she, is, she has wanted to be a deaconess for most of her life, and that has never changed. So, uh, that's again, neat. I'd love to take the credit. But then when I heard Dr. Herman was teaching our class, I was like, I, I, I bet that's a, a hoot <laughs> both ways, because she is not afraid to not only ask questions, but to give her opinion and to challenge your opinion. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, all right. As promised, uh, Dr. Kolb, we aren't going to go for three hours, but it's always a, a genuine pleasure to have you on, and we could go on this and on and on. This is great fun. Uh, but, but we will, again, do uh, by far the best segment of um, the podcast, which is called Right for the Pick and a Libra Than Tree, where we will ask you about a bunch of random topics. Uh, and if you like it, it's Right for the Pick and. Uh, if you don't like it, leave it on the tree. Feel free to explain to our listeners why you do or don't like it. Because uh, I'm, I'm always highly opinionated about the things that I mention. I guess that's not necessarily true. Sometimes <laughs> you just got to say things. But uh, yeah. I almost always start. So, Katie, I'm going to let you begin All right. today. I know exactly what I'm starting with. All right. The weather is really nice here. It probably won't last long. But ripe for the picking or leave it on the tree, driving with the windows open. Fresh air is always good. Okay. In in metaphorically as well as, <laughs> as literally. So I uh, I like it. Okay. That's right for the pick and for me as well. I'm I I don't think I'd ever own a convertible. Uh but But it's tempting. No. It's oh, not okay. even it's not yeah. even tempting. I mm -hmm. guess they're kinda cool. I, I, I would I would drive a convertible but I would never own a convertible. I actually have a dream of me and Dorothy going on an Italian uh, vacation together and driving down the Amalfi cruise like a James Bond character in all linen clothes <laughs> and brown leather shoes and like a convertible Jaguar. I do have brown leather shoes. I, I, I don't have enough linen clothes <laughs> yet. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's for the same reason, fresh air. Like yeah. I spend so much time inside. You know who asks for the windows down all the time? Talitha, but it's always 30 <laughs> degrees outside. So it's <laughs> yeah, it's right. F uh, okay. It's kind of right for the picking. I'm usually a sunroof open kind of okay. person because mm -hmm. I have long hair. Mm -hmm. So the actual windows can be a problem. But right. yeah, it's right for the picking. What you do is you just have to have the back windows a little higher than the front windows and the airflow is right. Yeah, you mm -hmm. have to figure out all the levels where they're supposed to be, otherwise. Yeah. Or you just roll yeah. them all down and sure. just enjoy the blast of fresh air. <laughs> all right, I, I've been asking this. I'm, I feel confident that I didn't ask you last time, but I, I started asking this question of all listeners just because I think it is significant for life. So right for the pick and leave it on the tree, pineapple on pizza. It's okay, but it's not really pizza. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I'm changing my answer because you keep asking me. And you it's keep going back and forth. Right for the picking. Is it now? Yeah, now it is. All right. There we go. I feel like you, you're saying that to be controversial. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> I am with you, Dr. Kolb. It is. It, you said it's okay, but really, I feel like the answer behind the answer was this kind of gross and nonsensical there are other ways to eat pineapple i've i've eaten it fresh out of the garden in yes. nigeria and uh, that might be the best way india yeah, yeah. somehow yeah. it just doesn't uh, exactly yeah. even for me like uh when uh there's like grilled pineapple it's not it's but it's, it's, it's leaps and bounds better than pineapple on pizza yeah but just just, just fresh don't. from the garden yep. is the way it's meant to be eaten in my opinion yep that's fair oh 
I don't have my normal list. This is a shorter list. It's all right. Mm. Okay. Ripe for the picking or leave it on the tree. Girl Scout cookies. Oh, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> that's that's real eating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, All I right. got I got 80 years experience with that. <laughs> Did you buy some this year? Not yet. Okay. No, we got to we got to find somebody because we had uh actually the granddaughter of one of my colleagues uh used to sell them at Timothy, but uh, she's grown out of that, I guess. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. That's good to know, because I assume there would be somebody in the congregation. I'm sure there is, yeah. but I haven't I haven't run into them yet. But it is the season. Yep. I, oh, it's big time right for the picking for me. Yeah. Yeah, we got ours a couple of weeks ago. Did you? But I don't eat gluten, so there's only one kind I can get, which they're not bad. They're pretty good. Mm -hmm. It's like toffee. Mm -hmm. It kind of just tastes like a shortbread. Oh cookie. yeah. Okay. Well, that's good. good. Yeah. The shortbreads are right. It's. But it's still sad, though, that you're missing on Thin Mints, yeah. which are the greatest Girl they Scout are. cookies. Thanks for reminding me. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you could eat gluten. I mean, physically, I can. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. It's personal <laughs> choice then, so no need to feel sorry for Katie. Yeah. It's her <laughs> choice that she's missing out. It's fine. I just get raging migraines if I do. It's fine. Cost of living, right? <laughs> the okay. cost of the, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I I went through my list, and I usually don't pick one for somebody in particular, but I came across this one, I and I found it intriguing. So it's it's right for the pick and leave it on the tree. Trivial Pursuit, the board game. Oh, that's great fun. Okay. Um, it's just that I don't usually do very well. Because they have categories like popular music. And, oh, uh, okay, <laughs> sure. And you know, in the in the sports trivia, there are very few football uh, questions. That is also true. You know, I, I I went in the other day after the great the really great game, all excited, and and they said to to my class on Monday morning, and they said, yeah, that that, that was quite a game. I said, yeah, three points, and they said, yeah, and I said. Leverkusen beat Bayern München. <laughs> and they said, what? <laughs> yeah. So, so you know, um, so I, there, are, there are certain categories that I, I prefer. It's right for the picking. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like, like random facts that, you know, someone asks and you're like, oh, I do know that. Don't ask me how, but I know it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not going to say embarrassingly. I almost said embarrassingly. The topic I'm probably the worst on is literature, just because of the breadth of yeah. the questions on literature. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I took quite a few, like, American literature classes throughout my education. But once you start to get into obscure global literature, you've lost me. Yeah. Um, but, like, the science ones... Those are usually right up my alley. The sports ones, I, and I appreciated your football joke. Did I tell a joke? Yeah, what exactly. Uh, well, only because I, I didn't hear it. <laughs> time in England, a couple sports that I never paid attention to that I began to. First was cricket because that was mm. what came on television, although uh, I watched a, a whole lot of one league and then it went to another league and the rules were different. So mm. I stopped caring about it. Not The game was the same, but the rules were different. And I was like, I, okay, whatever. Uh, but football or soccer, as we like to call it in America, and I get the logic behind one actually probably is closer to actual football than the other. Yeah. But Bayern Munich, because uh, well, they, they traded for Harry Kane and they were meant, I mean, they've always are pretty good, but this yeah. year... Yeah. I feel like they're having a little bit of a stinky year. Yeah. Which yeah. is surprising. They may not even come in second, although probably. Probably, but once they got Harry Kane, they, they were expected to just kind of dominate yeah. the league, and they haven't. Well, anyway, I, I do. I pay more attention to <laughs> the Premier League in England. Yeah. Uh, but I, re I read that article the other day, and I was like, interesting. Well, anyway, yeah. So I like Trivial Pursuit as well. Cool. It's like a game of woods. That's, that's it. But this is why you have to have. Uh, I I prefer. It. I mean, you could do it individually, but I think it's at its best when you have teams of, of at least two. In that way, yeah, one can supplement the other. But then if there's a topic that you're both strong on, 
the con internal conflict on the team is also entertaining. Yes. I appreciate yeah. the, the whole aspect of it. Yeah. I had one and then I forgot what it was. It's all the football talk. We lost you. It's all right. You mean the soccer? Do you talk? Uh, one day we'll talk about <laughs> sports. I think. You like sports. Yeah. Yeah. I like football. The, the real football. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not the one with the the oval shape. <laughs> 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 oval ball. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> sure. Uh, oh, okay. This is what I was gonna do. Write for the picking or leave it on the tree. Country music. Uh, let's just leave it on the tree. <laughs> uh, it's the same. I, I feel like Ben asked that question once, and I just, it's not for me. That's fair. <sighs> Everybody else on our team loves it. Well, I do have a caveat, though. The idea of, con well, I can't even say that. Some country music is just bad. Sure. It is really bad. So... Kind of right for the picking, but not all of it. I think technically, Dorothy and I's first dance as a married couple was a country song by Lady Antebellum, Just a Kiss. Yeah. But they're kind of a poppy country. Yeah, not my favorite. Yeah. So, mm. there you go. All right, let's leave it on the tree. Yep. All right, Dr. Cole, the last one from me. Uh, right for the picking, leave it on the tree. Broadway musicals. Oh, we better leave that on the tree. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> right for the picking. I don't know a ton, but the ones I've seen, great. I, I asked the question, and I was thinking of maybe one or two <laughs> that I like. But then what you said, I don't know that many, and then I started to think about. All of them that people talk about that yeah. you've never seen. Yeah. Right. But, you know, like a handful. Yeah. And then I, I think about some of them. I'm like, people love that for some reason, but it's not great. I, uh, I do like the music, man, because it was um, filmed in Mason City, which isn't far from Fort Dodge, where I grew up. There we go. See? You can find a reason to like one or two, yeah. right? But I guess I guess the genre. I'll leave it on the tree because it isn't something that I well, you were actively pursue. In the office, you were whistling Les Mis the other, like a while back. Yeah, but I don't think like Les Mis is a Broadway is. musical, though. I think it is technically an opera. Yeah. Oh. I think that's yeah, that could be. something different. Like, so, I, right. like Broadway musical, I'm thinking of one that I would care for because I was an actor in it, and it's relative is uh, Meet Me in St. Louis, where mm. I was I was in, in that for my church's nice. play. Nice. Never seen that growing one. Growing up. Well, it's, it's a... It's during the World's Fair, you, yeah, you should watch it. It's, I don't know. I, uh, <laughs> should watch yeah. it, could watch it. I don't know. Uh, yeah. But but there are others that just aren't. I don't know. I do, but see, but this see, I and now that I think about it, this would be an, another opera, and uh, I've failed at this because I I told Dorothy that if fan of them of the opera. I think her favorite opera was ever playing in St. Louis that I'd get tickets, and uh, it was, and, and I didn't. Mm. I just, uh, I just, I just, I'm just not a fan of the theater. I don't think I'll go every once in a while, but it's not just something I want to do. It's kind of, it's kind of boring. <laughs> I like good theater, um, but they don't have to sing. Fair, <laughs> that also fair. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, Dr. Kolb, as always, it's a pleasure to have you on. And uh, we asked you this question uh, before, but, but maybe the conversation will be a different answer this time. Uh, but if you had one piece of advice for anybody considering becoming a professional church worker, teacher, DCO, DCE, pastor, deaconess, what would that one piece of advice be? Oh, I don't think I can do one piece. I would say read your Bible, mm. do a lot of praying, um, but do a lot of listening. Learn to listen uh, and, and try to listen to the question behind the question. I love that. Listen to the question behind the question and just learn to listen. That is something I've definitely uh, had to do over the last many years, uh, at least better. Uh, Especially well, when you get married and have kids. If, if nothing else, guys, if you're not a, 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 in a profession that requires you to 
listen professionally, but you're married and have kids, you should also listen. But if you have friends, listen to them as well. Yeah, It's good advice for everybody. Well, thank you, Dr. Kolb. Uh, thank you. As always, it's, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the podcast. Uh, and thank you all for listening uh, and for tuning in. As always, if uh, you have that internal call, uh, this is the place to find out if you have an immediate call that is mediated through the Holy Spirit, through the church. To, to call you into ministry and to be their pastor or their teacher or their deaconess. Uh, don't think. Uh, fill out a request for information uh, so that we know who you are, and uh, we'll reach out to you and have a conversation in and around discernment uh, and your personal discernment of whether or not God is uh, leading you to this uh, because we're not meant to do it alone. Um, and so it, the conversation's free. Uh, there's, there are no hooks attached to it. Uh, and at any time you tell us you don't want us to talk to you anymore, uh, we won't, but I, I have a feeling that won't be the case. Uh, but if you know that the church word isn't for you, uh, but you've always looked at somebody next to you in the pew and you thought they would be a great pastor, teacher, deaconess, or the like, uh, also don't think. Make sure you tell them because you could be that person uh, that gives them the encouragement or that extra influence to begin to pursue uh, God's calling for them as in service of the church in a professional manner. Um, yeah. And read your Bibles. Pray and learn to listen to your brothers and sisters in Christ, but also to those who are outside of the body of Christ and listen to the question behind their question uh, because that could be uh, immediately related to their personal faith journey and faith formation and, and part of becoming into the body of Christ and a part of God's family uh, through baptism. As always, like, subscribe, uh, Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time under the fig tree. Take care.